back a year ago. Welcome, everyone, to another episode of the Beer Bound Podcast. Today, we are joined by Henry Jeffries. Henry was born in London, and after graduating from the University of Leeds, where he studied English and classical literature, he worked in the wine trade for two years before moving into publishing. Henry is a drinks expert and an award-winning author. His writing has appeared in The Guardian, The Daily Telegraph, BBC Good Food, and The Spectator. And he was the features editor of Spirit Specialists, Master of Malt. Henry has authored three books pertaining to alcohol specifically. This includes Empire of Booze, published in 2016, The Home Bar, published in 2018, and The Cocktail Dictionary, published in 2020. In Henry's first book, one that we're certainly taken with, is a loose history of Britain cleverly and humorously told through its contributions to alcohol, charting the rise of British power from its small corner of Europe to global preeminence. Each chapter features a historical period and a drink, tracing its origins and examining its impact on British culture, literature, science, philosophy, and religion. So we're super excited to speak to Henry and learn more about his text and his general expertise. So Henry, without further ado, welcome to the Beer Bound Podcast. How are you doing, sir? I'm very well. Thank you for having me on. Well, Henry, you certainly are an interesting man with uh, a wealth of knowledge in terms of alcohol. It seems like you've worked kind of in the professional fields of wine, and then you've delved into the publishing aspect, creating quite a few interesting works that particularly are of interest to me because I'm a bit of a history fan. So connecting alcohol to British identity of what it is today, it's pretty fascinating. So maybe I gave a little bit of information about you, but can you delve a little bit further into who you are, how you got connected with alcohol? Are you a bit of an alcohol fan? Is that suffice to say? Who are you? Who am I? I'm an enigma wrapped in a mystery. An alcohol fan. Yes, yes. Well, I'm very lucky that I'm married to someone who's very abstemious. She she doesn't drink very much at all. She's from she's from California. So if she has more than one glass in an evening, then it's um it's an excellent bottle of wine or whatever we're drinking. So she keeps me she stops the uh, the love of alcohol getting getting out of hand. I don't know, I suppose I've always been I've always enjoyed, you know, ever since I was allowed to, I've always enjoyed a drink, but I've always been fascinated by by the culture around alcohol, not just, well, what wine specifically. I mean, I worked for a wine merchant in, in Leeds after I graduated, mainly because I, I went to this shop called Oddbins, which was a small chain who, they still, they're still around, but they're not as well known, not as big as they were. And in this shop, everyone looked like they were having so much fun. You know, those sort of shops, you just, they're normally record shops or very occasionally bookshops, but it just looks like really fun to work there so I got a job there and I was curious about wine but without really knowing anything about it I just learned a hell of a lot there were people within the company who knew an extraordinary amount about wine and most of them were those sort of you get a kind of type of person who they're very clever but they're slightly under ambitious so they're very happy happy for a while to work in a shop open some wine chat you know and it was it was a fun time. I just learned a lot from these people who worked in there. Was, there, was a, there was quite a few odd bin shops around Yorkshire. Yeah, I just sort of fe- became fascinated by wine, alcohol, that sort of stuff. So that even when I left the wine trade, which I was only in in a very small capacity for about two years, I worked in publishing. I worked for lots of publishers in the PR department. Um, worked with, I'm trying to think if I worked with any Canadian authors. I think if I ever did. But, um, but I was always interested in wine. And so I started a wine blog in 2010. And that was, you know, the time when lots of people were starting blogs. And it got a bit of attention. And I got calls from newspapers saying, you know, could you write something on this or could you write something on that? And that's how it went from a hobby to a sort of part-time job to a career. So it sort of, it's all happened quite accidentally. I didn't kind of set out to think, I'm interested in drink. This is what I'm going to do. Yeah, I just sort of fell into it in a kind of lackadaisical fashion. So that's sort of how I got from, you know, being young 
to probably a career in alcohol. Now, you mentioned your two years working for a wine merchant. What did you learn in that period of time that shifted your knowledge of of wine? And, and how did you use your your academic background in literature and in your classical studies to to build these sort of two things together in into eventually creating some published works that pertain to to wine and alcohol. How did you become an expert in order to write your first text in 2016? Like your knowledge is quite deep and thorough, I should say, in the vast history that is the British Empire. And like, how did you become such an expert on this field in such a short amount of time? Yeah, it wasn't a short amount of time. It's been something that's been in my head for years. And I think, I I, I always say it comes from the shop, but I, the wine merchant I worked in, where you'd have these labels. So, you know, you'd have Sherry and it would be Harvey's Bristol Cream. You'd have Port from Portugal. It would be Graham's. You would have Bordeaux and it would be Smith Oat Lafitte. Uh, Smith, um, what is it? Smith Oat, God, I can't even remember what it's called. But anyway, you have these names like Smith, Brown, Taylors on products that are French, Portuguese, Spanish, and I just thought, you know, there's a there's a there's a story here. What why why have these wines from places that aren't Britain got British names? And then I thought, you anyway, know, then it's the same with with sort of rum, and then you have things like beer, you know, it's slightly different. You have kind of IPA and stuff. And I just thought that there was a story here that tied together kind of everything about the country that I lived in. Clearly alcohol was very important but more than that it wasn't just about drinking there was a sort of cultural thing there was a a love of different varieties of of alcohol and there 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 was some sort of story there but it took me a long time to put it together so I probably had the idea in about 1999 I probably started writing it in about 2009 so I had 10 years of it sitting at the back of my mind and most of it was, you know, I, I did have a, I, was, I went to university and I studied English and I did cl- classical literature. But, but, but that was, most of the, the work on the book was all my own, you know, it, it was reading books. It was, you know, discovering things. I'm a, I'm a bit of an autodidact, so I like learning stuff. I like, you know, getting books and trying to become a, a bit of an expert and it, or, or, or I suppose a kind of instant expert on things. But it took me an awful long time to turn this vague idea into a semi-coherent book. And even then, the book isn't particularly coherent. It's it's quite episodic, so each chapter is a drink. What I really wanted to do was have something that told like the whole arc of history through drink. But I just couldn't work out how to do that. So in the end, I I, I did it into, into separate drinks. Yeah, I love the way the book is written. And you can tell you're quite a gifted storyteller you have a you're quite a gifted orator I must say so I wanted to know where that comes from in your life just even being interested in studying literature these great stories that go back hundreds and hundreds of years in in your country where does that come from with you yeah I mean I don't it's it's a hard one to to say because my father my father is a chartered accountant so there's not much similarity there but then again, he's always we've all, it's it's always been a, a a bookish household. So we have a lot of books in the house. My father collects books. He has first editions of things like Brave New World and things. So it was always reading was always considered very very important, even if my father never actually studied literature in any form. Um, so I suppose it's something from the family background. But I was also I was very lucky. I went to some good schools where I had some very inspirational teachers, especially for English and history, who, you know, just kind of inspired a love in language and, you know, Shakespeare and history and that kind of stuff. I, you know, I, I hope that people still have teachers like that, but they were, you know, they made, they made learning, they made culture seem something that was fun. And, and there was something that was entertaining. It wasn't dusty, dry old books. The past came to life. Writers came to life. So I've been, yeah, there were a few teachers who really inspired me. And I think perhaps my 
slight kind of raconteur act comes from them. It comes from like trying to be like those wonderful eccentric English teachers who I had when I was 16. Okay, so Empire of Booze, 2016. I really, like I mentioned, I really did enjoy this text quite a bit. And it taught me a lot. Obviously, our connection is a little bit stronger with beer, but it really proves that the vastness of the British Empire, how it had such a strong effect in global markets, in building different um, industries, obviously beer of the day, maybe if you focus on the British Empire 200 years ago, was probably the working man's drink of choice. But in terms of what the entrepreneurs and the merchants of Britain were doing, expanding different types of alcohol, obviously you focus a lot on wine, but also you mentioned rum and and many different other types. So can you go back, where does your book begin? How far back in British history do you start with? And can you give us a sense of where does it all begin with, with the British Empire and its connection to alcohol? Not necessarily where it all begins, say, thousands yeah, of years ago, but where did you to... begin? Yeah, where I began was the roots of drinks that we have today. So even though there's lots of exciting stuff about you know, Anglo-Saxon drinking mead, and even Bordeaux in the Middle Ages. So for a lot of time, the kings of England were also the dukes of Aquitaine. So the little southwest France, sort of Bordeaux and stuff. So they they shared a common ruler. So wine from Bordeaux was, for all intents and purposes, English wine. And it came over in huge quantities. But it's not really related to the present day. So I kind of thought about, what do we drink today? You know, what, what are the big drinks that we drink today? So we drink Bordeaux, we drink Bordeaux style wines, you know, Californian Cabernets, that kind of stuff. We drink IPA, we drink stout, we drink Scotch whiskey. How far back do they go? And then why have these archetypal, these styles become archetypal in a way that say, I don't know, sour beer from Belgium hasn't or a Chenin Blanc from the Loire hasn't. Why did these particular, and it is slightly arbitrary, you know, there are, there are wonderful wines from the south of France that are still very, very obscure. And there's no reason why, there's no sort of reason to do with how good they are, that they didn't become famous and say port did become famous. So the reasons why these wines, beers, spirits became, and the reason is to do with history, culture, taxes, war, that kind of stuff. And it fits the story of England and then later Britain. So when um, England joined with Scotland in 1707 with the Act of Union, it fits the narrative of England's rise from, you know, quite an insignificant part of Europe to a global power. And it... Um, it tells that story, so it can be told through each drink. And I start perhaps slightly, um, I think slightly oddly for most people, but with cider in the 17th century. And you have these, you have this very interesting time in English history. You have uh, the civil wars, you have the king being deposed and executed. You have the restoration when the royal family came back. So it's a very turbulent time. You have Catholics and Protestants, religious wars, you know, with the kind of thing that happened all over England. But you also have this amazing um, ferment in the sciences. You have uh, Isaac Newton, you have Christopher Wren, you have Robert Hooke. So it was just this incredibly rich period in English time, in English history. And then there's a drink connection to that because some of these scientists, as well as you know, coming up with physical theories like the theory of um, gravity and stuff, were also experimenting with alcohol. And I kind of joke, it's like as if NASA had a homebrew division. You know, it's like these top scientists who were making cider and trying to make it because at the time England was at war with France. So the idea was... So French wines had become very expensive. So the cheap Bordeaux, there had been oceans of cheap Bordeaux in the 15th century. That was gone. So you needed a replacement. So you had these scientists trying to make this wine-style cider. 
but they'd also invented this strong glass. So previously glass was very fragile, it's like a decanter. And they created this glass, and then they realized that they could try and harness the pressure from fermentation, the carbon dioxide, and deliberately make something fizzy. And so it's the sort of precursor of champagne, one of the archetypal, or, or sparkling wine, or sparkling cider, or indeed sparkling beer, any fizzy drink, or even, in fact, when you go into a shop and there's all these bottles of wine or beer or, you know, the fact that you can have a thousand kinds of beer in one shop is to do with the invention of the wine bottle and this particular period in English history in the 17th century. So that's where I start. And then I go through the periods up to the modern day with a drink telling the story of each period, kind of going up to Australia in the early 20th century. And then it kind of ends because then America is the most influen influential power when it comes to drink. And England has faded into ins insignificance comparatively. Yeah, Henry, and, and I'm I'm curious to see if you had, this is a bit of a side question, but if you had any pushback to your text because it it is um, pushing up the importance of Britain in the global alcoholic market. And you make some some claims, of course, sort of bestowing the the Bordeaux wine culture to to being a, a British invention. Have you? I'm just curious to see if you had any like pushback from proud French wine connoisseurs or perhaps Portuguese wine connoisseurs who say, "Hey, wait a minute, Henry, you're taking credit for this. You're you're giving credit to the British for this, but when in reality, well, no, that's our territory, or maybe you're." Do you know what I mean? I, I, have you had any pushback? No, in that no, regard, no, I know exactly. No? I, I, do you know, I'd be, I'm very surprised by how little response I've had from it because I, for, for first of all, I, I'm not claiming that these drinks were entirely British. I'm saying that they were made often by, often by British people, but often not, often by French people, Irish people, Portuguese people. But they were made for the British market, which was the sort of richest, you know, it's like, Nowadays, you wouldn't make an English language film without thinking of the American market. In those days, you wouldn't really market a drink without thinking of the London market or the Edinburgh market or the or the Dublin market. But it's also, if you think about, I, I've just think about this the other day. If you think about it in terms of clothing or in terms of sport, it was a similar thing. It was the sort of birth of a global culture, and it was the Victorians and people a bit before that in England and in Scotland and places who codified that so you know chasing an, a, a kind of inflated pig's bl bladder around was turned into association football or rugby football or you know hitting a stick with a bat was turned into tennis or cricket and it was a similar thing with alcohol the Victorians codified them and turned them into these archetypes either deliberately by you know setting rules and stuff or just by being the most popular market so that these things emerged. And it's a similar thing with clothing. If you think about how people dress formally, you know, the, the business suit, which is still, you know, not, you know, the baseball cap is now taking over somewhat, which is kind of American cultural imperialism. But the, but the British thing was people ate the British they because they wore the suit. And it was a similar thing with alcohol. So even though I'm not saying for example, I think the you know, champagne is very much, a, even though a lot of the technology originally came from England, it's very much a French invention. In fact, a Franco-German invention, because a lot of the champagne houses were German, like Bollinger and Krug and Heidsick and stuff. But it was the British money and kind of cultural influence that shaped all this kind of stuff. And you take, you take the British thing away and you have all these little independent people, often making very good wine, but they wouldn't have achieved kind of global significance, I think, without them being taken up by this global empire. Yeah, I think that's really it. Your focus is that obviously being the, the hegemonic power of the globe for its heyday, I guess you could, let's focus particularly on the Victorian period in the 19th century, Britain dominated the world. So kind of as a, by a default, it would dominate markets that were quite popular, such as alcohol, that makes sense. I'm jumping a little bit ahead. You mentioned that now, obviously, the United States has sort of taken the torch and 
really become the the global dominant force. That's that's certainly true probably in the last three quarters of the 20th century. Do you still see that? Is that still suffice to say that the United States is the dominant player in in being in dictating the rules and the culture and the markets around alcohol? Or are we seeing perhaps another force coming to the fold in terms of becoming this dominant dominant player? I think it's still very much America, though I don't think it's quite as much as it once was. So the American the sort of American rules are still all in place, you know, like the, the cocktail, um, serving drinks with ice, Coca-Cola, um, the kind of cult of the wine critic, you know, giving wine scores out of 100, um, craft beer, all that sort of stuff. That all came from America, though often it was adapting English or French or, or whatever um, influences. And I still think though that those are still the rules by which the global alcohol trade functions. Those, but 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 I don't think anything new is being created. Really, I think it's just going over old stuff. And then obviously the Chinese have their own market, but the Chinese market doesn't really the, the kind of how a Chinese drink hasn't yet pushed beyond the borders of you know, the, the Chinese culture or the Chinese diaspora um, yet. And whether it will or not, I, I, I'm actually not entirely sure. So I think it's still America, though America is not coming up with anything new. So it's sort of, there's a slight, I don't know, it feels like the kind of, the kind of global alcohol culture is quite stagnant at the moment. And it's basically a kind of churn of reviving old things, but with America still being in the driving seat. Who dominates as the cultural superior entity with alcohol? Is it the major producers or is it the major consumers? Yeah, no, it's a good one, actually. I mean, it, it, it's really hard to know. I think like the, it's just, you just sort of wonder where, where do these changes happen and why do they happen? Like, it's, I think it's very interesting what happened in America in the 70s and 80s with craft beer, where, you know, you had a, a situation which obviously you'll know better than I did, where you just had a few massive brewers making their, you know, their their big lagers, and it was a grassroots thing, wasn't it? It was people just being fed up with having beer that didn't taste in it, of anything, and I think to some extent they were inspired by what was going on in England at the time with the birth of real ale and camera. I mean, again, you probably know more about it than I do. Um, which is a grassroots thing. You know, it's not the big players saying, getting to going to their drawing boards and saying, you know, let's cook up something new. This was this was people power. Um and then then another sort of fascinating one is with is with gin. Because like in, in the 90s, received opinion was gin was dead. Like, you know, all the big companies in Diageo and stuff. They were just gin was managed to climb. So it was like, you know, there's a few old people that go to the golf club, they have their gin and tonics, but they're dying. Don't put any money into it. And then you had like all these new brands coming through. And then people, you know, bartenders getting really into gin and rediscovering the old the classic cocktails, the cult of the the, the, the dry martini came back. And that's again, that's a sort of grassroots thing. That's people being interested in stuff and obviously there's some kind of leaders in the industry pushing that but i think it doesn't come from above i think it, a lot of it comes from below if i'm not mistaken your expertise are more focused in the whiskey market yeah well i mean i i, I edit this blog for master of malt about whiskey so i'm i wouldn't say i'm an expert on whiskey i'm still really learning because it's a big big topic but i i do drink a lot of whiskey and i do um I go to lots of distilleries and talk to, I talk to, I'm kind of in the whiskey world, though very much as a sort of beginner rather than an expert. So is your focus on contemporary whiskey? It's not on the historic development of whiskey, although I know that you do have some expertise in that because of your book, but you're looking at what the contemporary markets of European, British, North American whiskeys, what's going on. That's that's sort of your realm and in, in what you study and what you know a lot about. Yeah, I suppose very much with the emphasis on what's going on in Britain, in, in Scotland, 
mainly in Scotland, obviously, but there's a lot going on in England. Most of the exciting American stuff never comes over because it's made in too small a quantity. We don't get any Canadian whiskey apart from from the big distillers. You know, the, all the we read about all this craft distilling going on in Canada, and none of it, none of it reaches because the quantities are too small. Um, so we're very much focused on. You know, we know obviously we get the big brands. We get you know your we get your sort of um, you know, Canada Canadian Club and all all those sort of ones, uh, lot forty and things. But apart mm-hmm. from that, we're very much Scotland, um, Ireland, and England and Wales. There's some nice Welsh whiskies at the moment. Is it so, is it true to say that the market in the UK is still very dominant in Scotland for whiskey? Is that that just seems basic to me? But is that is that not true? Oh yeah, yeah. I think for most people in England or most people in Britain, whiskey is Scotch. You know, it's and I and I and I don't see that changing in the foreseeable future. American whiskey, you know, people like it, JD and Coke. Some people are quite into their bourbon, um, but it's mainly Scotch. I mean, though, I, Irish whiskey is is definitely getting a lot more visibility. You know, Jameson is obviously is huge. And then there's other other brands, you know, Redbreast, which is made by the same people who make Jameson, is really really good. And then there's lots of tiny distiller, distilleries in Ireland, which again, very small quantities, quite hard to get hold of, quite expensive. Um, but there's you know there's a lot there's a lot of exciting stuff going on in whiskey. It's just the demand is 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 incredible. So it's very hard. So if if, if something is in demand. It basically means you can't get hold of it. Mm-hmm. I've noticed that too, just in my own personal life of seeing online ads for the larger Scotch brands like Glenfiddich or Glenlivet. Like I've seen just the, I've just noticed the production value of a lot of these commercials that I'll see on Instagram or on YouTube are, they seem to be just elevating quite, quite enormously in terms of the quality, the quality of the content that they're pumping out. So I, it seems like they're doing quite well. Yes. Well, I mean, that's that's the worry. Just coming in from a historical point of view, the problem with, with 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 Scotch whiskey, which it shares with things like sherry, is that it's an aged product, and generally, Scotch whiskey is aged for about you know minimum about about seven or eight years. So you have to anticipate demand, and every single I think Glenfiddich have doubled their capacity, and I don't know from how many million liters of pure alcohol a year to how many million but they've all done it so glenn livet glenn fiddick um they've all increased their capacity capacity enormously because they've looked at the graph you know here it's going up like this it'll get to there but there's no guarantee it will get to there and in the past in well as recently as the 1980s there was a massive crash in the whiskey market because in the 70s demand was going up so they built all these new distilleries, they increased capacity, and then they were just sitting on all this whiskey. I, I remember there was a thing when I was working at this wine merchant. They used to do all their own label whiskey, and it was incredibly cheap. So it was like £15 for a 20-year-old Isla Malt whiskey. wouldn't say where it was from, but this was them getting rid of overstocks. And I think we'll see that again. I think all the every single distillery but not just in scotland globally has banked on it going like that it's not going to go because in in the past things don't always go up you know they go down as well and then you think about what's happening in russia huge market for whiskey you know big market that's gone china is building its own single malt distilleries so i think there's going to be there's trouble there's trouble ahead in whiskey it's not but that's that's my personal opinion that's not that's not the opinion of uh, of the company that I that I work for. Well, I take your word much higher than than a lot of people, so I I believe you. It's uh as a as a Scotch fan and I do have the opportunity to to go to the UK maybe once a year and I always try to bring back a bottle or two of scotch and I mean the prices are pretty high, so maybe <laughs> Maybe if the prices of scotch could go down a little bit, that might be beneficial. But I certainly don't want to see that at the at the uh, expense of the entire market. No, well, it's not going it, to. It'll it'll bounce back, but it, it's cyclical. It's you can't you can't manage the you can't manage demand because it's you can't just turn the taps on and off. And even if you could, it would still be very hard to manage because it's unpredictable. There, mm-hmm. There's that 
there's that fashion element. Scotch whiskey was very fashionable in the 50s, not very fashionable in the 70s and 80s. Kind of, again, in the in the noughties and tens, became very fashionable again. You can't really predict that. Mm-hmm. It's a bit of a roller coaster. Well, Henry, let's go back in time. We're focusing on now, but let's go back to your book, uh, Empire mm-hmm. of Booze. You obviously analyze quite a few different types of alcohol. Can you maybe focus on maybe one or two that you see as particularly pertinent to the growth of the British Empire, some particular alcohols? And I know you, in terms of wine, I think you'd focus on quite a few different sub-styles, I guess, of wine or, or different regional wines. So maybe you could touch on that. But but one particular style or maybe two that you really see as prominent in terms of its association with the growth of the empire? Yeah, that's a, that's a very good question. I suppose, I mean, go to your world, something like IPA, just because it's so emblematic of, of, of what was going on in India, where you had a private company, so not the British state, the East India Company, setting up trading places, sort of Bombay, Calcutta, that kind of stuff. You know, at the same time, the Portuguese, the French, the Dutch, they were all doing the same. But the British were perhaps more rapacious, um, more successful, and gradually they started taking over. You know, they would get involved in some local war and they would they would sort of take over a bit and take over take over a bit. You know, again, this is not a thing I'm an expert in, but it, it's um you know, it's a sort of fascinating thing to look at. And they needed they needed something to drink. They couldn't brew in in India, it was too hot. The local drink, Arak, sort of date palm thing, was incredibly strong. All right, back with Henry Jeffries. We obviously had some technical difficulties last week. He's joining us again um, a week later, same time on Monday, January 30th. Well, Henry, my apologies for the technical difficulties, and I appreciate you working with our schedule to be back with us. So I believe, I think we'll just start off where we left off. I believe we were discussing, you were jumping into a little bit of of your book that pertained to beer. And I believe I was asking you about the specific type of alcohol that was perhaps most pertinent or most connected to the growth of the British Empire, perhaps in the last 250 300 years i think that's was my last question correct me yeah if I'm i think wrong. yeah i think you think something like that yeah i think i think i mean ipa is a really interesting one because it it kind of ebbs and flows with not just british influence but with the influence of other countries so you start off with a beer a strong beer from from hodgson's in london that was taken to india and sold to british soldiers and uh, civil servants and you know entrepreneurs and things in in India and they found that on the sea voyage it's quite a well-known story but on the sea voyage they discovered this very strong beer eight nine percent full of hops quite a hard thing to drink they discovered on the six month journey through the tropics it turned into something sub- sublime rather like Madeira or sherry or something matured on the high seas the same with what became known as IPA. And then other breweries, such as Allsops in Burton-on-Trent and Bass in Burton-on-Trent, began brewing their own IPA. And I think it picked up the name in the early 19th century. It became known as India Pale Ale. And so it was this very strong beer that was sh- shipped out to India. And it wasn't the only beer in India. Porter, you know, dark beer was sent out. I think weaker beers were sent out. But this was the sort of cult beer, and it gained a sort of cult thing. And they began brewing it for the English market, but it was sold, or the British market, rather. So it was sold as, or in fact, the rest of the rest of the empire. And it was sold as, as IPA, and that became a, you know, it was a fashionable beer. It was the sort of, you know, it was what the middle classes drank. It was expensive. It was a lot more expensive than, um, just ordinary ordinary beer and then gradually it that's what became it, it lost its name ipa what was ipa became pale ale just which what became eventually morphed into kind of standard english bitter and became lower and lower in alcohol because of 
various things like during the First World War, huge taxes were put on malt and things like that. So the alcohol levels gradually went down. And kind of real IPA, this very, very strong, hoppy beer, sort of died out. But what's very interesting is that the sort of pale ale in the form of bass became a global beer, probably the first global beer. You know, you know the trademark, the red triangle, and it's in that famous painting by, who is it? Is it Monet? Oh, gosh, I, I think I've got it wrong. Is it Renoir? You have the Folly Berger, and you've got the barmaid, and then there's bass behind. And it, and it was the first, and it was in, exported all over the world. So this beer that was IPA came back to England, and then from England was something similar was exported all over the world so you have the kind of empire the sort of the indian empire then you have the commercial empire exemplified by bass and the first age of globalization which was well the first probably since the roman times which was dominated by by britain and then gradually ipa itself or beer that was known as ipa either disappeared or became a shadow of its former self so it wasn't wasn't particularly strong. It wasn't particularly hoppy, and then in, in America, they you know we all in with your well you're I know you're, you're in Canada, but I think it, it it happened over the border as well. They inspired by developments in England with um, small breweries, the kind of preservation of classic styles, began to brew classic British and and some kind of Belgian styles as well, but mainly classic british styles and they brewed them using american hops and made them strong they made them seven eight nine percent and these incredibly vivacious ipas were then exported back to england and then and britain and then we tried them and we're like wow why aren't we making ipas like this so then british ipas started copying the american ipas that were copying the old british ipas and then you started seeing brewers in France and Germany and Denmark brewing IPAs based on this kind of Anglo-Indian-American model. Um, so it's fascinating. You, you have kind of waves of um, influence, both imperial and cultural and economic, of both Britain and America reflected in this one beer so i just find it and i probably told the story not not that brilliantly because i'm not an expert on it and if you really want to know the story you read pete brown's book hops and glory um but it just it's it's, it's incredible it's an incredibly rich story absolutely it's i'm not sure if you're familiar we we spoke with uh, a longtime brewer and he wrote a text on the ipa as well his name is mitch Steele, and he wrote oh, okay right right yeah and he wrote about exactly what you said that, that having a more hop rich beer in order to make its way the long journey to to the thirsty british servicemen serving in the indian colonies so he he mentioned that there was a little bit of a a myth surrounding that in terms of the myth being well the most popular beer in the british empire of the day would have been for your working class englishmen and that would have been like a dark ale, something like a porter or a stout that we know today. And the myth is that that style of beer couldn't survive the long voyage. And he says, well, it did. It did survive the long voyage. And it, it actually, they sent far more porter than they did IPA. But actually, IPA was a bit more of a classy, sophisticated beer that went straight to, you know, the the officers. It was an officer. It was an officer's yeah, drink. It was expensive. That's right. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah. Exactly. So I'm interested in that a little bit too. And I, I like what you said too. I think the IPA is a great metaphor to what we were speaking about previously, about how the handoff was sort of given from the UK to America with being the the dominant force to dictate what alcohol cultures exist into maybe the late 19th and then obviously into the 20th century because the IPA is obviously a British concoction, a British invention, but now, I mean, you think of the IPA, it's very synonymous with the craft beer market and that really is an, an American piece, a piece of American dominant culture. So I think that's interesting. Your book did, can you, can you, reference a little bit about the the standings of class and society with alcohol what were as we as i just mentioned porter was the working man's drink ipa was a little bit more sophisticated 
you don't have to stay on beer, but can you touch a little bit, Henry, on what alcohol meant in terms of class situations for both the British and maybe for the uh, the consumers of British alcohol? Yeah, yeah. Um, well, something like wine, like table wine, sort of claret, was only really drunk by the upper middle classes and the middle classes until in the upper classes until very very recently until maybe the 60s and 70s people did not drink table wine they did not drink wine with their meal they would have drunk they would have drunk beer even until even until the 80s wine didn't become that popular in, in england if people drank wine it would have been port sherry that kind of that kind of thing and I mean, the last time that table wine was was popular in England was medieval times, from from Bordeaux. So there's always been wine's always been seen as something for the upper classes. It's always been drinks have always been stratis, strat, stratified by class. But then there are certain drinks that kind of cut across class, like something like gin has been drunk by by everyone. It was once a drink of the poor. Then you started seeing better brands like um, Tankery and Gordon's and things like that. So you'd have sort of upmarket gin. So I suppose at sort of every at every level, there was a cheap version and a more expensive version. So port, you used to get cheap port, which w- would have been drunk mixed with lemonade. And lemonade isn't what, you know, isn't made from real lemons. It's like a synthetic drink made from sugar and carbon dioxide and that used to be the sort of pub the drink of choice for ladies in you know not very nice pubs it used to be it used to be a kind of famous sort of ladies of the night would have a port and lemonade to keep keep the chill out um but you also had vintage port which was from a particular year it was very expensive you'd keep it in your cellar for 25 years before drinking it so every every drink had a um you know, had a, had a poor and a rich equivalent. But I don't get, I mean, that's not really, no, that's not really unique to Britain. If you think about French wine, it's very hierarchical. You have the Appellation Controle system, where you have at the top, you have kind of AOC, then you have what used to be called Van de Pay, I can't remember what they call it anymore. And then at the bottom, you have Van de Table. And then in, you have Bordeaux, you have Premier, you have the Premier crew, Tuzium crew, you know that, that kind of stuff. So the, the the French are even more hierarchical with their drinks. So they're what you know they have the the wine is carefully stratis, stratified into layers, so you know exactly what you're buying. So I think I think that's not you know not an unusually British thing having drinks defined by class. You speak a lot about a few different wines in Empire of Booze, and you you've referenced this a few times. Can you talk about what port? meant for the british empire what is a port style wine and and what is its connection to the development of the british empire well port port was the answer to a perennial problem of what do you drink when you're at war with the french so previously where wine came from france which is next door in fact bordeaux was part of the english crown or not part of the english crown but it was a territory that was owned by the kings and queens of England, so they were also the um, the the, the, Duke, the dukes of Aquitaine. So even though they were technically the French, technically, anyway, you don't really need to know, know, know the kind of exact the legal thing, but it came from France. And then during the seventeenth and eighteenth century, England, as it became more powerful, came into conflict with France, um, and it was often at war with France. Tax, big taxes were put on wine. At some point, this is especially when William the Third came to the throne in 1688, who was a who was a Dutchman. It led to war with France, pretty much on and off for about 115, 120 years, ending with the defeat of Napoleon. So you needed to get the wine from somewhere else. So the English went to Portugal, which was England's oldest ally, and initially they imported kind of light wines from around the city of Porto, which were quite high in acidity, high in tannin, low in alcohol. They didn't travel very well, and almost everybody hated them. But then gradually, entrepreneurs went up country to the Douro Valley, which is very, very hot, 
very hot during the day, cold at night, perfect for growing grapes. And they brought back this wine that was much stronger, much darker. And this was much more to the English tastes and it traveled much better. And this wine arrived in, in England and pe people loved it when it, when, it, when, it, when it was good. And it's not clear whether it would have been dry or sweet. It probably, some of it would have been sweet, some of it would have been dry. And they used to add brandy to it to kind of to help it travel, also because people liked it stronger. Um, apparently, someone told me recently that they added brandy during fermentation to slow the fermentation down because it was so hot, it would sometimes get out of control. However, they, however, they, they, they added brandy to it. And if you added brandy while it was still fermenting, after a while it would stop fermenting because it would kill the yeasts. So you ended up with a sweet wine. So gradually people got the taste for the sweet ports rather than the dry ports. And it became a sort of cult drink, especially amongst Georgian um, sort of Regency period, late, um, late 18th century. But there was also a political aspect to it as well. So if you supported the um the jacobites who were the supporters of king james then you you would have you would have um, wanted to be allied with france so you would have drunk bordeaux you would have drunk claret and a lot of scotsmen who the who, who supported the stuarts would have drunk claret so drinking port was a way of showing that you supported the hanoverians the the, the, the kings who came after william the third George the first, George the second, George the third, etc. So it became it became a statement of your politics, what you drank. So it was like a culture war thing. If you supported one tribe, you drank claret. If you supported the other tribe, you drank you drank Bordeaux. And you used to get these. I saw it at a stately home. It was a decanter and glasses that were just that had the Stuart coat of arms on the the the, the, the Jacobite kings and it showed that these people were, were where their allegiance was and they were probably and there was a religious aspect that roman catholics tended to support the jacobites and protestants the hanoverians so wine port and claret bordeaux were kind of mixed up in this religious cultural kind of conflict um so and port was the um was the was, was sort of the victor and it became like the most British wine that you could drink. It was a way of it was a patriot patriotic thing to kind of to drink port. It's also political, isn't it? Yeah, yeah. It was it was it was it was it was political. Um and the Scots or certain Scots, they would toast the old alliance, which was the alliance between France and Scotland, and they'd obviously toast it with with Bordeaux. But then a lot of the Scots were, you know, they were doing very, very well out of being allied with the English so you know they would have in fact a lot of the port companies were Scottish Graham's Sandemans they were all from Scotland so it's not like it was it wasn't like all Scots were against it a lot of them were for the Hanoverian succession and making a lot of money out of it so it's um you know it's I hope I've, I mean it's very very complicated mm -hmm. I hope I haven't explained it too badly no not at all it's it, your allegiance tends to be swayed by your mercantile interests above anything else i suspect i suspect but yeah, okay. yeah i think so i think I, what i also liked about uh your book henry is i learned about champagne you touched uh, a chapter on champagne what what is the connection between the british empire and champagne well yeah i mean that's that's a sort of complicated one because i'm i, I, I sort of quite a lot of the press for the book was sort of saying the British invented champagne, and that's not really what I'm claiming at all. The process for making champagne, for, for, for fermenting wine in a bottle to capture the bubbles, had its roots in experiments that were done in England in the 17th century. So you had certain scientists at the Royal Society, the inventor of a strong, dark glass wine bottle was probably an Englishman called Sir Kenham Digby, and thanks to his invention, you could bottle wine, cork it while it was still fermenting. And the idea is six months later, you would have a fizzy wine. And they discovered that you could add sugar to that to do the fermentation. Then this technique went to France and the French perfected it. So you had Verve Clicquot, 
um, the kind of works of Louis Pasteur, Madame Pomery, they all took this sort of quite these rough techniques pioneered by English scientists um, and turned them into the champagne process where you could make wine fizzy. But the, but the English connection doesn't really end there because initially the, the biggest market for champagne was Russia and it used to be sold sweet and it was for the... Um, it was for the czars and the aristocracy and stuff, but they, but the London market, or not just the London market, but the the, the Edinburgh market, the Dublin market, the Bristol market, were very very lucrative. You had these very rich markets on the doorstep, and the the Champenois began exporting their products. You know the sort of Bollingers and the Krugs, who were all most of them were Germans. So the entrepreneurs who began selling it, Hyde Six, is why you have all these German looking. It's where you see so many umlauts. Perrier, Jouet, Moet, all these names, they were all Germans. Um, so they they began exporting to, to the English market and it was a different sort of champagne. They began making champagne with, with, with less and less sugar in, which was aimed at the gastronomic market. So, so you had these new hotels in London, like Claridge's and the Savoy, which had, um, you know, a, a French style food. And the most popular wine to drink was was champagne. And the interesting thing about the way that the champagne was marketed was Bordeaux, you had it, it was very hierarchical, you had your chateau and things like that. Whereas champagne was very easy to understand. You had a brand name, you had amazing advertising, you know, kind of naughty Edwardian gentlemen and Art Nouveau and just, you know, these fantastic. So you just, you know, it was like, scotch whiskey it was easy to comprehend so even though it was expensive it was something that the you know the, a rich englishman scotsman wh whatever could quite easily comprehend and they go to their local swanky hotel and splurge on it so until very very recently the biggest market for champagne outside france was england i think we've been overtaken by america just but until 10 years ago so the, it was what we know of as champagne a sort of well-marketed dry product was de designed for the British market. Henry, can you elaborate a little bit on the technology that was invented? Um, you you mentioned the fizziness of a wine that's so synonymous with champagne. Where did that come from? What's the development in that? Is it still the same? Is it still the same technology that we use today in order to make champagne champagne? Yeah, I mean, yeah, roughly, roughly. Um, so what? So to begin with scientists would they would take a wine or a cider that was still fermenting and put it in a bottle they'd cork it they'd leave it somewhere cool they'd hope that the bottle didn't explode and then they would um open it up and hopefully it'd be fizzy and often it wasn't then they discovered that if you added sugar to the wine then it would um the fermentation would be would be stronger so you'd more likely to get a fizzy wine and also it more likely to explode as well and this process was um uh, what's the word perfected was fin you know was was gradually perfected during the 19th century and as people understood like, you know the works of louis pasteur and stuff understood fermentation better the technique became better and better and nowadays you have a technique which is known as the champagne method or the traditional method which has evolved over 200 years where you make a base wine from normally from sort of Chardonnay or Pinot Noir or Pinot Meunier, and then you put that in a bottle. You add a solution of yeast and sugar, um, or or yeast and wine, or you know. So, but the important thing is is the yeast and something sweet, um, and you put that in in the bottle, and then they put a a cap on it. And then they leave it on its side in a cellar for 18 months or something. And that does two things. First of all, it creates the bubbles. So, the, so you get the fermentation goes again, the sugar and the yeast interact, starts fermenting again. There's nowhere for the bubbles to go. The glass is now really strong. You know, they used to, apparently in the cellars of um, beneath Champagne, they used to wear metal masks because the bottles used to explode. But now the bottles don't explode or very rarely. Um, but also the sugar interacts with the yeast to create something called a, I think it's called a Mallard reaction, 
So you get, which is where you get those biscuity, kind of caramelly, nutty flavours from as well. And it also does something else. The grapes from Champagne and from England have very high acidity. And the, the process of ageing them, re-fermenting it in a bottle, softens the acidity. So it's a way of turning quite unpromising grapes. So in Champagne, they used to make still wine. Most of the time, it was awful because the climate wasn't very good for it. But th this process means that you can, it softens it. And also, most Champagnes are blended across the years. So you you you, you have wine in storage, which is kept getting richer and richer and you add some of that to the new vintage before you bottle it so you have this consistent product i should have mentioned the blending across the years before before the bottle so it's often usually a blended years so it's in the bottle lying in the cellar gradually getting fizzy developing all these lovely flavors and but the problem is that you've got yeast in there and you want a perfectly clear bottle so you you, you used to have this technique called riddling where they would get the bottle and they would gradually turn it upside down so that its neck is facing down, twisting occasionally. So all the yeast goes into the into the neck of the bottle. They now have machines called gyro pallets that do it. And they have these huge machines and they're full of bottles and they kind of move very slowly and gradually turn the bottles upside down. And then you have a process called disgorgement, which is usually done. Though I discovered that actually they don't, always do this but they usually freeze the neck of the bottle which freezes the yeast the machine opens the bottle the yeast comes flying out and quickly close it again um keeping all the fizz in but before they quickly close it again they add something called dosage which is it's either um sugar or it could be fortified wine something to sweeten it because the wine is still very very dry and it, that could be up to well, it could be up to 50 grams a litre but it's normally about eight grams per litre of sugar is added to the bottle sealed up again and then you normally leave it for three months six months just to integrate and that's the process i've probably kind of i've sort of jumped around the steps but you basically make a wine put it in a bottle leave it add add yeast and sugar leave it for a while take the old yeast cells out sweeten it slightly close it up again and then you and you've got champagne or english sparkling wine or very, you have very nice sparkling wines in canada actually perhaps not as sophisticated or profound history as what no 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 i mean the history got there but then but it, it's the great thing about the, the champagne method as i said before is it's a great way of turning grapes that are a bit too high in acidity for a table mm. wine into I mean, that's why the English wine industry is based on making champagne style sparkling wines. It's a very it's a great technique for making great wine out of grapes that are a bit too high in acidity. Mm -hmm. Well, Henry, we're coming up on our hour mark, so I obviously want to be respectful of your time. But I thought maybe we could end by you selecting maybe one or two different types of alcohol that you focused on in your book. And maybe can you give us a little analysis on on where this type of alcohol has gone from perhaps its inception up until 2023. That, that's particularly remarkable to you, something that has a story that perhaps shifted through different economic classes, maybe that's that's rotated or changed its appearance or its characteristics in some way, something that really has a tale that was unpredictable or changed in a particularly interesting way. I don't know if we talked touched on this before. I wish I, I wish I could remember. Bordeaux is so interesting because at the time when modern Bordeaux was created, which was sort of in the 17th century, most uh, most important wines, most um, most uh, high status wines, let's say, were sweet or they were very strong, or you know they were things like sherry, Madeira, um, port, that, that that kind of thing. Um, and port came a bit later, but or they were wines from, you know, from sort of Ven from Venice or from the Greek islands and stuff. They were all kind of sort of a Malvasia, that 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 sort of thing. Those were the sort of high, or, or or you go back to antiquity, it was the sort of sweet wines that were the most highly prized. 
And Bordeaux was something new. It was a made from red grapes and only red grapes. It was aged in new oak casks or sort of newish oak casks. It was it was it was macerated, so you got lots and lots of color. And it was the only it was the, nothing else was like it. And gradually, that has become what wine is. So in the 18th, 19th and 20th century, every country that started making red wine tried to make its red wine in the image of Bordeaux. So for example, Barolo from Piedmont used to be sweet. It was a sweet wine. And then one producer who'd been to France said, you know, let's try and make it like, like Bordeaux. And so Barolo, which we think of as this, you know, classically Italian wine was was changed to make it more like Bordeaux. And it was the same in in Rioja, this kind of local plonk. These producers went, let's try and make it like they're doing over the border in France. Same in Chianti. And then gradually in California, Australia, New Zealand, they were like, well, let's try and make our own Bordeaux. You know, so they were, but because they were new countries, they would use French varieties. So they'd use Cabernet Sauvignon, Merlot, that kind of stuff. So whenever you go to the, the supermarket, you've got your Chilean Merlot or your Californian Cabernet or that sort of stuff. It's a direct descendant of this unique wine in the 17th century that was created for sort of aristocrats in London and um, kind of all, all over Britain. And it's become, it's become the dominant red wine in the world. And I think I think that's fascinating. So every time you have your Chilean Merlot, you go to the supermarket and buy you know what seems like a Cassiero del Diablo. It seems like a very ordinary wine. It's directly related to this particular wine from France. Henry, I do want to touch on this too quickly. We mentioned this before we got started. You have another book that you just finished and that will be coming out potentially in the near future. Do you want to speak to that quickly? Yes, yes. I don't know if it'll 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 reach. Canada, I think it's unlikely, but it's called Vines in a Cold Climate, the people behind the English wine revolution. So it's about how English wine went from a joke, I mean, literally a joke, to beating the French in 30 years. So it starts in the kind of early 90s and ends about now. And it's basically about how a cottage industry got serious. And it's actually, I mean, it's, some of the main people behind it are an American couple who founded a, an estate called Nye Timber and they went to Sussex and they were like, the climate here is great. The soil is just like champagne. Why can't we make something like champagne in Sussex? And they, and everyone thought they were absolutely insane. And then they realized they weren't. And then people started um, imitating them or not imitating. They were inspired by them. And you now have a sparkling wine industry and you're starting to see some very nice non-sparkling wines, kind of Pinot Noirs, Chardonnays, that sort of thing. So it's about, it's a, it's that story. So it's, it's a very, very English story. It's, it doesn't really, I don't think it'll sell even, you know, I don't think it'll sell anywhere outside Britain, I'm afraid. But yeah, I've just finished it. So I'm feeling quite relieved. Well, don't sell yourself too short, Henry. The title again, one more time, I'm sorry. Yeah, Vines in a Cold Climate. Vines in a Cold Climate climate. Well, Henry Jeffries, author of Empire of Booze, The Home Bar, and The Cocktail Dictionary. Henry, I really appreciate your time and your accommodation with our technical difficulties. So I learned a tremendous amount from reading Empire of Booze and expand my horizon a little bit more beyond simply beer. So I appreciate your expertise and your, your wonderful text. And hopefully we can do this again in the near future so I can pick your brain a little bit more about the extensive alcoholic history as it pertains to modern oh it was great fun i'm great happy brain. to come on at any time thank you be sure to subscribe to stay up to date on all our interviews and beer related content remember craft beer is here